In this video I'm going to be making some directional loco lights, specifically for a Lima Class 33, which with its head code blinds presents some particular challenges, but my method could be adapted to many similar models. Over the next 15 minutes or so I'm going to cover the entire project, including DCC conversion, the electrics for my LEDs and making the head code panels themselves, so feel free to linger on the bits that are relevant and skip the bits that aren't. I've already done a significant amount of work to the body, with a complete respray, the addition of some detailing parts like the hoses for the push-pull operation, new decals, flush glazing and some new grab handles made from wire. But to complete my makeover I need to reinstate the head coat panels, adding some directional lighting while I'm there. For this I'm obviously going to have to remove the body again, but with the Lima 33 this couldn't be simpler just flexing the edges with a twist of the tip of a scalpel blade and inserting a wedge of plastic or even a thumbnail and easing it up and over the clips on the chassis. The visible lugs certainly wouldn't cut the mustard on a contemporary model but the ease of removal is a blessed relief compared to the shenanigans of getting into some of those. The first thing we notice is just how much space we've got, particularly without the moulded glazing unit which usually holds down the weight. I glued that down when I did the flush windows. Now onto the electrics. My directional lighting and motor control are going to be provided by DCC. So this bit of the video is effectively a DC to digital conversion and even if you don't get onto the lighting you may find it useful. It all starts by removing the existing wiring and if you've got one of those little brown capacitors that can go too. Then on to installing the DCC chip. In the past I've wired these directly but I've recently discovered these brilliant little sockets. There are quite a few different ones out there, but I particularly like this one, with its clearly labelled solder pads. You can also get them with different pin configurations, but an 8 pin decoder will be more than enough for my requirements. And I'll be using a nice fat foam sticky fixer, thick enough for the ends of the socket pins that stick out the underside of the board to sink into, so they don't short out when I stick it in position on the metal weight, which halfway down the chassis seems the obvious place to put it. And pressed home firmly, I can get on with the wiring. For this I've treated myself to some specialist decoder wire, which really does help make the job much easier. Its narrow gauge is sufficient for the kind of current we're talking about, and it's easy to manipulate, so we can tuck it away neatly. It's round about 4 quid for 6 metres, so getting all 4 basic colours does mount up a bit, but we'll only use a little bit per installation, so if you're going to do lots of conversions it's definitely worth it in the long run. I'm going to start with the connection to the pickups on the trailing bogey, soldering the black wire to that spring clip, just like with the DC, stripping the ends of the insulation with my precision wire cutters I got specially for the job. Again, a bit of an investment, but one that's definitely paid off. I've oriented my socket so the pad for the black wire is on the right side, and I'm just melting a little bit of solder onto that and the spring clip, before remelting around the tip of the wire. First the end for the pickups, and then on the socket, forming a nice shiny pool. Now onto the pickups for the motor bogey, and I'm going to need to wire from that little stub to the appropriate pad on the circuit board. I reckon my second hand loco has been modified at least a couple of times, so I'm pretty sure this isn't standard. But working with what I've got, one end of the red wire can be soldered to my socket, and the other to what's left of the wire from the pickups, ensuring we've got a nice clean connection. Then I can route it around the side of the motor, keeping it clear of any of the moving parts. Now for the grey wire, which goes to one of the commutator brushes on the motor. DCC wiring may seem complicated, but actually it's incredibly simple. The red and black wires take the alternating current from the track to the decoder, which outputs a variable direct current to the motor via the grey and the orange. So all we're really doing is splitting the original wiring into two halves, with the decoder in the middle. Then to finish up, at least as far as the motor is concerned, I need to do the same thing with the orange, soldering one end to the sprung brush assembly and the other to the square pad on the socket, laying down a bit of solder first, before trimming and stripping the end and soldering in place. Now all we need to do is fit the decoder itself, just making sure we get it the right way round before pushing the pins into the socket. Then before we get onto the wiring for the lighting, let's put this stage to the test and make sure everything that we've done so far works as it should which indeed it does, accelerating smoothly under DCC control in both directions. Now onto the lighting and I'm going to be using something a little bit different, in the shape of these surface mounted LEDs, which will attach to a bit of prototyping board, making a flat unit for the windows at either end of the loco. In the past I've used the traditional bulb type LED, so this is going to be a bit of a departure for me, and a bit of a fiddly one at that. 
My prototyping board is pre-drilled for traditional through-hole components, with rows of copper cladding on one side. It'll eventually be just the length of the window, but I'm going to keep it long for now to make it easier to handle. As its name suggests, the surface-mounted LED will sit directly on the copper-clad surface, with a little bit of solder at either end, making the electrical connections and holding it in place. On the back of the LED is this metal panel, which I can't quite see the point of, because the primary connectors are at either end. But just to be on the safe side, I'm covering it with insulation tape. Then I know it won't interfere with anything. The width of the LED is just right for the height of my head coat blinds, but I am going to need to get it straight, so I've lined everything up with the grid on my cutting mat. And with the prototyping board held down with a blob of blue tack, I'm laying down a little bit of solder. The surface mounting pros would use some solder paste, but I'm very much working with what I've got to hand. And without a fancy reflow oven, I'll be relying on my soldering iron, just with the finest tip I've got. First of all, with the LED held in place with tweezers, I'm doing a quick melt to establish the position, followed by a second one, gently pressing down the LED onto the surface. And then the same for the other end, first to line up, then to press down. And you can see, even without fancy equipment, I've got a pretty good result. I'd already anticipated that getting the right brightness for my head code lights was going to be a challenge. They're not really headlights at all, and will need to be much dimmer to be realistic. So I built myself this testing gizmo for trying out different resistor LED combinations. You can see how I made it in another video. But essentially what it does is mimic the operations of the DCC, just in a more accessible way. The orange light for the motor, and obviously the white ones for the lights. Here, I've got forward and reverse rigged up to different value resistors, and it's easy to see what impact that has. My job now is to find out the right resistance for my flat LED, so I need to get that into the test rig. And for that I'm going to need some wires, preferably with a plug on the end. And this ribbon of rainbow jumper cables will be ideal. I just need to split it into the colours I want. Not only is it going to be great for my testing, I reckon I'll end up using it in the final installation, where the plugs and sockets will be ideal for joining the wires during assembly, so I want to keep a usable amount at the socket end when cutting to length. For the resistor tests, I'm going to solder the wire to the furthest end of the prototyping board, keeping the area around the LED nice and clear, ready for the more permanent wiring, which will include the resistor. One issue I had was I couldn't see a way of telling the polarity of the LED, so I just guessed which one was the anode, and my first push of the function button did nothing. But it was easy to switch the yellow and the blue over on my test rig, and sure enough, I got it the wrong way round, and on my next test, it worked fine. So all I've got to do is switch over the blue and the yellow on my circuit board, and we're good to get on with the resistor testing. I've since worked out there's a tiny notch in the plastic at one end, which indicates the cathode, but it really is so small that it's not surprising that I missed it, but I'll know for next time. Then with the correct wiring, blue to the anode, yellow to the cathode, I can see how bright my LED is going to be in situ. My starting point was the 36,000 ohms left over from the previous test, and that's in the right ballpark, but I reckon I can go for a bit dimmer, so I'm going to try out something around about three times as much, the precise value being quite arbitrary, just something I had in my box, and that can go in my test rig. Eventually, I plan to use a translucent diffuser, so I'll need to take that into account, and I reckon with my new resistor, my brightness is now about right, and I can get on with making the permanent units. As I mentioned earlier, the prototyping board will eventually be shorter, but I'm going to leave it long for now, just to make it easier to handle. And first up, I'm moving the yellow wire from the bottom to the top of the board, threading the stripped end through the hole, and soldering to the copper strip. Now onto the resistor. This could really go anywhere in the circuit, but my plan is to integrate it into the lighting unit, which seems the neatest solution, as I can cross over from the outer strip, the one with the anode of the LED to the middle one, which isn't currently connected to anything. That can be for the blue wire, which after snipping off the spare bits of the resistor wire, can be threaded through the board and soldered in place, exactly like the yellow one. Then, with all our resistor testing out of the way, and a start made on our fledgling lighting unit, we can go back to our loco. Now this may seem glaringly obvious, but we do need everything to be the right way round, particularly the body on the chassis. It will fit either way. But checking photos of the real thing shows that the fuel tank and that big vent need to be at the same end, the one with the motor on the model. So I've got out my label maker, and made a sticker so I don't forget when it comes to reassembly. Getting things the right way round isn't just about realism, it's going to be crucial for our lights, the wiring of which we pick up at the decoder end. Just like for the motor, each wire has its own pad on the decoder socket, and I'm starting with the yellow. 
soldering that short length that I put aside earlier, the one with the connector socket on it, and then the same with the blue, being careful not to melt any of the other wires along the way, and then back in with the decoder. Now for the first time we've got our lighting unit attached to the chassis, and the important question is which end does it go, illuminating the direction of travel rather than the other way round, and the only way to find out is to give it a test on our real track, with the light unit blue tack to one end. With our 50-50 odds it's not that surprising we chose the wrong one, but what we have learned is it's the motor end that uses the yellow wire, and the only problem with that is our wire at the socket end is a bit short, but easily solved with an extension. And with everything plugged in again, we can repeat the test, this time with the lighting unit at the right end, the LED coming on with a push of the function button. Now it feels like we're really making progress, and in order to see the lighting unit in situ, it's time to shorten the board. Then with a couple of blobs of blue tack to hold it in place, I can position it behind the centre window, remembering it goes in my stickered motor end. And we can see how the extension to my yellow cable has really helped, making reassembly straightforward. And with the body clipped to the chassis, I can get my loco back on the test track. And from an electrics point of view, we're halfway done. I just need to make another unit for the other direction. Essentially the same as the first, but using the white wire instead of the yellow, and maybe a bit neater. But obviously we're a little way off finished, and we've still got some modelling to do, primarily making the frames for the lights, and the first thing I need for that are some dimensions. And referencing old photos off the internet, and a lot of trial and error, this is what I've come up with. The scale accuracy of the old Lima model isn't that brilliant, so it's mostly a case of getting the look right, often coming down to a fraction of a millimetre. But I reckon each blind is about 1.8 by 3 millimetres, and they're about 0.75 millimetres apart, all in a black frame, just over 7 by 10. And this is what I've done with those measurements. I've made a grid of correctly sized panels in my page layout program, which I'm going to print out on my inkjet printer. Firstly onto plain paper, which will be my diffuser, then a second identical printout onto transparency film the two layered together, hopefully giving me the opacity I need. And to help that as much as possible, I want to use the highest quality print settings, and those for the appropriate media, which sometimes are quite buried in the dialog boxes. In this case, Adobe Acrobat, the file being a PDF. I'll try and find a way of sharing that, so leave me a comment if you're interested, or message me on Mastodon or Twitter. Links in the channel info. Clearly, I've got way more than I actually need, but as my transparency film is A4, I thought I might as well use as much of it as possible, with a contingency for muck-ups and mistakes. And with the light coating of spray mount on the printed side of the film, I need to accurately line up my targets, and press the two layers together, before trimming out with scissors, just the two that I actually need. Now we come to combining the frame with the lighting unit, and this is the one I did for the other end of the loco, which is quite a bit neater than the first, but we've still got quite a bit of raised solder, which brings me to my secret weapon, Sugru, moldable glue. If you haven't come across this brilliant stuff before, check it out on the internet. It's particularly good for repairing cables, because it stays flexible even when dry. But it's its plasticity that interests us here, because what I want to do is build a layer between the circuit board and the frame, the same thickness as our LED. And our Sugru will mould itself around all those bits of solder, giving us a totally opaque surround with no chance of any leaking light. Now I'm going to be using only a tiny bit of the packet, but carefully sealed and kept in the fridge, the rest should last a while. And when I've built up my layer, I can tamp it flat with a suitable tool, like an old HDMI cable cap, and then trim the edges with a sharp knife, ready to stick on our head code frame. But not quite yet. The problem being we can't see the exact position of our LED through our white paper diffuser. If only there was a way of doing that. And of course there is, thank goodness for our test rig. And with our LED illuminated, we can spend as long as we want getting the position exactly right, before pressing in place, and leaving to dry before we get on to the next stage. Which of course I didn't, and whilst I didn't have any disasters, it did make it a little bit more difficult. I'm mounting my completed lighting units in a similar way as I did before, but instead of blue tack, I'm using the Sugru again, making sure I get the right one in the right end, as when it's dry, it's gonna be a permanent stick. But until then we've got plenty of time to adjust our position, checking it by eye from outside, and making sure it's square and secure on the inside. Now we've just got one last soldering task to do, which is to add the decoder end of the white wire, and a second wire for the blue, as both lights share a common anode. Then with the two units installed and left to dry overnight, we come to the moment of truth when we can connect the whole thing up, which is made easy with our plugs and sockets, and making sure all the wires are neatly tucked inside, replace the body, clipping it in place. Now we're ready for the first run, 
and with the push of the function button, we're in business. I'm really pleased with the brightness level, definitely worth the resistor testing, and the printed frames have worked well. So if you've got an old Lima 33, perhaps give it a makeover and add some lights. If you've enjoyed this film, why not check out some of my other projects? And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe.